Good morning. My name's Maurice Crespi. I'm the managing partner of Schindler's Attorneys. Thanks for joining today. Um, this is COBRA. COBRA is a pro bono initiative um, that was formed over a month ago between IQ Business uh, Engaged and Schindler's Attorneys. Um, COBRA is there to assist businesses in one way or another. Uh, we assist businesses um, by having turnaround specialists um, uh, assist in negotiating between debtors and creditors. Uh, we have business rescue practitioners. We have uh, the likes of IQ Business to assist in big, uh, when it comes to big businesses. And the idea is that we assist wherever we can. We also have a knowledge base, uh, which is very, very useful, particularly when it comes to the funds. You'll find that knowledge base on our website, www.cobra.org.za. What we also do is we um, uh, have webinars, daily webinars, such as this one. Uh, the idea is to provide information to the public and to also deal with specific queries, um, specific issues that you may have that may be specific to your industry um, or specific to uh, your team. Um, what, we, what, what we can also arrange are Zoom private sessions if you have specific questions um, that you don't want to ask uh, today well, at a webinar. Today's webinar is going to be very, very different. We won't be running through Business Rescue. We do that on uh, Mondays. So if you want a rundown on Business Rescue, you can either have a look on the COBRA website where all the videos are posted, or if you want a webinar where you actually participate, please join us on Monday where we go through Business Rescue with the Business Rescue practitioners, with the experts and they'll take you through it. But today we've got a fantastic, uh, different and most interesting webinar. We have Angela Obrey. Um, Angela is going to be taking us uh, through uh, what should we consider when negotiating over the phone, email and via video conference, and how do we create value and rapport during digital negotiations. Um, uh, is to, to give you a, a bio on Angela. Angela is a highly experienced negotiation consultant. She's also a commercial mediator with a career spanning over 20 years. Uh, most of her career has been in international space, UK, Ireland, and Germany. But she's also worked with local companies in South Africa, Accenture, uh, Investec, and more recently, Edcon, um, and Accenture towards the end of 2019. Uh, she's pa passionate about the topic and believes that the study of negotiation is never ending due to the many elements uh, that contribute to an outcome. Um, uh, it's also a topic of her thesis. Her company, Amplify Business Group, has partnered with COBRA in providing negotiation support and expertise for distressed businesses, their suppliers, lenders, and even internal teams as they negotiate their way through unprecedented times. Um, so. Um, negotiation, communication. Um, we're dealing today with um, non-vocal um, uh, 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 forms of communication, which I find, I particularly find, really, really interesting. Um, you know, one must be mindful of the fact that language in itself um, only emerged relatively recently, but prior to that, we had. Um, uh, we had to rely on non-vocal forms of communication. As Richard Dawkins, uh, a famous quote by Richard Dawkins, she says, we are a unique ape, we have language, and other animals have systems of communication that fall far short of that. They don't have the same ability to communicate com complicated conditionals and what ifs and talk about things that are not present, um, which is possibly true, but I think what we're going to hear today is that the non-vocal forms of communication are as important, um, particularly when it comes to business and particularly when it comes to negotiations. So I'm going to hand over to you, Angela. Thanks so much uh, for joining. But before I do, I just want to mention that we have other panelists on. We have Peter Gordon. Uh, he is from Engaged Business Turnaround. He is um, uh, on, and we have a discussion with him on, um, on Mondays, where we go through Business Rescue and he gives us his insight. We have Tasneem from Schindler's Attorneys. We have Gary Borachowicz from Schindler's Attorneys. Emma Marseille from the IQ Business Group. Um, we have Bob Gruer. He is also the IQ Business Group. Dean Wright, uh, he's Schindler's Attorneys. Dominique Lloyd, Schindler's Attorneys. Artisha, 
um, from IQ Business, and finally, Angela from uh, uh, Schindler's Attorneys. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Maurice. Okay. I presume you can see me? Yes, I can see you perfectly. You're right. Okay, great. I'm going to start, me, start sharing my screen. Um, if you'll give me a second, apologies for this. Um, okay, share. Oh, so sorry. There we go. Is it, can you see it? We can. Excellent. Okay, there we go. Over to you. Thanks so much, Ange. Great, th thank you. Okay, thank you for the warm introduction and for uh, having me on this uh, on, on your webinar series. Um, I'm excited to be here, mostly because I I, uh, I really love this this topic, but but more importantly because you know, during these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to contribute and help you know where we can, um, not just in business rescue, but but you know to our communities and so forth. So, you know, to, to be invited to uh, run a webinar has been um, as exciting as I said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to jump straight in and um, and talk about about negotiations. You've, you've probably seen this this um, this picture, um, a picture of an iceberg. And, and what it represents in terms of negotiations is that, you know, when you're negotiating, it's like an iceberg, you only really see the top of it. Um, there's only so there's some things that you can see and there's some that you're not. You don't have, you don't always know what's what's below the surface, um, how big it is, what you know where and um, what intentions are and so forth. Um, today we've got an hour, but if you let me, I would speak for the next you know 24 hours straight. <laughs> um, the, the the topic drives my energy, but um, and that still wouldn't be enough because as as Maurice said earlier on, you can study this topic for the rest of your life. There's so much to it that, that um, you, you, you would never get there. There's, there's, there's a lot to learn, social skills and power and trust, and uh, you know, lots, a lot of effects um, in negotiation. So today, what we want to look at is, um, given these unprecedented times, given that we find ourselves you know, safe at home, and, and negotiating across video conference, email, um, telephone. None of this is new to us. You know, we've we've used this as a medium before, but we we also don't necessarily um, we don't also necessarily in, you know enjoy the mediums. We don't necessarily know how to use them. Um, I'll I'll put my hand up and admit quite freely that you know on the technology side, you know sometimes I battle. Um, so is that going to is that going to you know hamper a negotiation? Possibly, if you know, as as you saw, I opened my screen in the wrong place. Imagine if I'd done that in a negotiation and had given away a, a position and and you know showed our bottom line, for example. So you know today's today's session is to is to help you know warn against uh, that was that wasn't intentional, but it does does fit in nicely with what I'm talking about. But today's you know we'll, we'll warn against what some of these pitfalls are. And how you can mitigate it, and more importantly, how do we create value and build relationships despite um, the circumstances that we find ourselves in? Um, I'd like to touch on every one of these points that you see on the screen. You know, the physical environment, body language, strategy, tactics, and an hour is simply not enough. So um, you jump in, Maurice, if you have a if you have a question or a pop up on the on the chat. Um, but also, by all means, feel free to call me afterwards and discuss any topics that might have popped up or, or piqued your interest. Okay, so so looking at at, um, at contextual cues, Maurice already said that you know language is fairly new, and research has shown you've, you've heard this before a number of times that is that words make up only thirty percent or or less of your communication, and and the balance is all nonverbal cues. Um, so, what is the best way to negotiate? Yes, email has its place. Yes, um, telephone has its place. But you know, studies have shown that face-to-face -face negotiation gives you the best results. That's been taken away from us. So, so you know, it, it, it's it's the richest medium, and and it's not it's not entirely available. But we've got we've got technology. So we've got video conference. I'm coming to you in a video conference. And um, is it the same? Definitely not. Um, yeah, I could, um, you could, you could take me into an audience of a thousand or ten thousand people and put a microphone in my hand, 
and I'm confident and comfortable and you know you bounce off the audience energy you make a joke they laugh and suddenly you settle in and um, you can talk impromptu off the, off the bat and it's absolutely fine but put a camera on and suddenly some people become uncomfortable some people love it but a lot of people become uncomfortable and now we find ourselves having to discuss important deals and uh, make big decisions that impact people's livelihoods uh, potentially and you, you, you're not necessarily in your comfort zone. Um, so looking at this picture in front of you, 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 you know, face to face is a very rich medium. You've got body language, you've got micro expressions. If you take a down a level to the telephone, you take away, you block this, you, you're blocking the pictures. You can't see my, my hand gestures and my smiling or, or frowning at, at a proposition that you may have made. You've lost all your visual cues, but you, you can still rely on voice tone and inflection. When it's written, when it's email, you've lost that. You've lost your verbal um, context cues as well. Um, and it's a very lean medium. And that's not, you know, email, email negotiation is not new to us. Most of us have had some kind of negotiation, even if it is with our, our, our spouses. Uh, you know, let's go here for dinner, no, backwards and forwards via email. But um, we just need to be aware of the, the pitfalls because the choice of medium could actually, you know, insulate. Um, it, it's a good thing, potentially, because you can insulate some of the, the negotiation noise. Um, in our case now, I suppose a lot of us are, are worrying, me in particular, because my camera's live, are worrying about physical noise. You know, my children interrupting. Um, or you know the neighbors might have some you know sort of mowing their lawn or something, um, but there's also there's also psychological noise like perception and bias and so forth that you could use tools to to overcome. Um, if we look at video conferencing specifically, a picture in front of us is a is a is a Zoom call, and um, on the right shows you a number of of different technologies. One of the one of the um, pitfalls is that, that there are so many different technologies available that it's really hard to be on top of and familiar with and affair with all of them. So it is worth practicing beforehand. Incidentally, I did practice beforehand and um, putting the presentation up and it worked perfectly fine. And when it came to broadcasting live, I, I made the mistake that I was worried I'd make. Um, so you know, be aware of all of these different options, Zoom and, and Teams, and I haven't even heard of Blue Jeans um, and FaceTime. We, we've got a standard joke amongst our friends when they, if, if, if you know, if we FaceTime each other, saying, "I'm oh, sorry, I, I can't FaceTime right now. Can you call me back when I'm not so ugly?" Um, but but the truth is, is that with video conferencing, you've got a lot more to worry about than um, than just the, the content and what you've prepared. Um, you've got to think about things like your background um, you know, is it distracting? You, you know, if you look at that picture in front of you of the, of the gallery of many people, I find that I'm quite distracted by, number one, there's lots of movement. People very seldom sit still in a camera. And so it's difficult to hear what's going on because I'm looking at everybody moving. Secondly, I'm having a little look at what my colleagues' houses look like. You know, how tidy are they? Um, how organized are they? Um, or worse is that you can't see a background because somebody said right up close um, and uh, you know and there you lose hand gestures so even though video conferencing seems like a good solution to negotiation face-to-face you know, -face negotiation it does have its drawbacks so um, you know I've, I've intentionally put my camera further back because I'm quite animated and, and hand gestures are important for me to build a core and, and get my points across um, and you know you, you can't necessarily ask counterparts to to do the same. Um, I found that you know um, using a wide angle, for example, not because we not because we've been isolating and eating, but using a wider angle will give somebody some context of where you are and you make you feel more personable. Because at the end of the day, what do you want to do? You're trying to build um, build rapport. You're trying to to um, create value and trust. Trust is very important. You know, it's, can you imagine, you know, signing a, a billion dollar deal with somebody that you've never met? Um, video conference is, is a, a second best to that. So um, all of these things have got to be considered um, when, when looking at video conferencing and, and the medium of, of negotiation. Angela, I don't know if I can just pop in there. I just, sure. maybe, 
maybe it's, uh, it's, uh, another thing that I find works quite well is that I also get distracted by looking at myself in the camera when when having that. So you you know it's very weird to see yourself live at, back at you as a mirror view. So I find sometimes what helps is if I just turn that mirror view off in Zoom. Um, I, I think I speak a lot more naturally. Uh, and probably come across a lot more naturally in terms of video. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very happy you, you mentioned that, actually. I, f I find that um, people tend to look at themselves more than they do anybody else for the first bit of the conversation. As soon as the interest is peaked, it might, it might, uh, it might change. So I think that's a really useful tip. Thank you, Dean, um, is to find a way to turn it off. I don't know how to turn it off at this point in, in Zoom. Um, and as we, as we go through more Zoom calls, you know, and, and use this technology more and more, so I become more fair. It's, you know, one of the features I would absolutely um, recommend to people. And um, you've probably seen this, this next image. Um, it was Boris Johnson when he hosted his first, first digital cabinet and proudly displayed it for the world to see. Um, you know, quite rightly, it is, it, it's quite a thing to be able to continue business, all of us in our homes, thanks to technologies. Um, but of course, you may recall that um, it caused quite uh, quite a bit of chaos in, in the media because people were saying that um, that there was a security risk because you can see in the top left of the screen that the Zoom meeting ID had popped up, um, and and, and uh, it's it's been well known that in Zoom meetings Zoom have been criticised for some of their um, security issues. You know where people have popped up unexpectedly into the wrong meetings and so forth. That's being addressed, and they addressed it really well. They responded really well. But but the point is is that um, we need to think about privacy and security challenges that come with video conferencing. So um, I'm sitting in this room. You have no idea what's going on on the other side of my screen. There might be three other people sitting there. Um, and if I'm in a negotiation, you don't know necessarily, and this is true for email and telephone, of course, but you don't necessarily know who, um, who you're speaking to or who is um, listening in or if you're being recorded. Um, one of the things I always say, this is face-to-face, -face, this is on camera, this is on the phone, um, is that, and I said at the outset of a negotiation, and I, I frequently remind the counterparties, is that, that nothing's agreed until everything's agreed. But of course, if somebody's recording you, they could take something out of context. And, you know, um, so it's just something to keep, you know, be, be mindful of uh, about the type of information that you show and, and say. Um, and, and, and in this day and age, you're pretty much recorded in all, all the mediums. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons I like video conferencing is because you still get an element of body language. Yes, I can't see where their feet are pointing. So I don't know if, you know, if I'm in a meeting with somebody and their feet are pointing at the door, I know they want to finish, they, they're done, they want to get out, it's easy, I can't see that. Um, but but I, still, I still get some other cues. So if I put a proposal forward, I'll, I'll make the proposal and, and intently stare at their face to try and see what was the reaction. Um, you know, the, this example on here talks about um, looking for lack of crinkles around the eyes to detect a fake smile. Um, it, you know, that, that, that's true. I, I look for that, but I've got to also remember the context, um, which is, you know, test the person maybe at Botox. Um, and with body language, you've got to be so careful because even in, even in real life, you've got to understand context. If I see somebody, if I put an offer forward and somebody's sitting like this, you'd automatically assume that they're defensive, they don't like it, that they're not going to um, respond well to the offer. But you don't know, the context that you've lost through the video is that you don't know if maybe they are sitting in a room that's, and they're freezing cold. If you're in the room with them, you can, you, can, you can feel, you can see perhaps this person's cold and not necessarily not receptive to this offer. Um, one of the, the um, good things about video conferencing is that you can, you can engage in engaging in small talk and finding commonalities and building rapport is, is lovely. So use the time in the beginning to do that, to, especially somebody you haven't met, um, to you know, spend a little bit of time getting to know each other and smiling and letting them you know, start to form a, a, a view on who you are. Um, and so that when you take it off the video and onto email and telephone and so forth, they, they, they start getting a sense of, of your tone and what you might have meant. Um, one of the, the things that you lose in a negotiation on, on video, I believe, 
is, is micro expressions. And I'm not sure if you have had any um, insights into micro expressions. So just to give you a very brief overview, um, in fact, if, you, if you'd like to see a, a, an amazing TV series, you can watch a series called Lie to Me, which is where they talk about, uh, where they use micro expressions and the whole, the whole um, series is about detecting de um, uh, deception. And this, the, the gentleman that you see in the screen on your right is Carl Lightman in the show. And he's actually, he's actually um, not too far from the, the name Carl Lightman is not too far off from the real guy called Paul Ekman, who conducted these studies. He started in the 50s. And in the late 60s, he spent time with um, an isolated tribe in Papua New Guinea to, to understand what are the seven facial expressions that, um, that, you, that you use when, when you are um, surprised or, or happy or you show contempt or sadness or anger or whatever it is. Um, there is no way to prevent them. These are expressions that pop up on your face that are a glimmer. They, they apparently one twenty-fifth of a second. So you, if, so you need to be looking at somebody um, and really closely observing to find these flickers of, of the expression because there's no way to prevent them. The, the, whether they're an isolated tribe in Papua New Guinea or whether you're looking at um, the, the guy sitting next to you, if you, if you give them information that makes them feel angry, there is a micro expression, even if he is very well composed and doesn't show it. And if you're looking for it, you can pick it up. Now, I found that on video conferencing, I lose that because despite technologies being good and transmission being great these days, it's not perfect and it's difficult to pick up on these micro expressions. And let me give you an example of, of what they could do to a, um, an outcome of a negotiation. So if I'm proposing a consulting fee for services, and I'm sitting across from the table with somebody and I say, right, I'm proposing that um, for my, my services, I'm going to charge you $100,000. And I look at their face and I see suddenly um, happiness. Then I've realized that, that maybe I've, I've gone in a bit low. And so I can then adjust marginally and say, that's our basic fee. Very just off the bat of my head. I've seen that this is the expression that they've, they've shown happiness. And um, even if they've kept this composed, this composed face, I can... And adjust my, I can adjust and say that's our basic fee. However, if you want to add X and Y to it and travel and so forth, you're looking closer to the number around 150. Um, and then you know that that you know you, you you've um, you've got for your, for yourself, certainly as a consultant, a, a better outcome. And again, watch the expression when you put that next offer forward. Having said that, if you take it back and you've and you've um, you said I'm proposing 100,000 for this service, and you see fear or disgust, fear because they can't you know, afford it, but they really want your service. What you could do is you can adjust, say, having, but, uh, you know, I've, I've always looked at your, your company, I've admired your company, so whilst our fees are usually 100,000, I'd like to um, give you a 25% discount. They, they've they've done, um, conducted studies over the years and um, looked at, at um, sales teams. They've looked at the car sales teams and, and another another um, type as well, I can't recall. But um, what they looked at is their ability, whether they've had training or not, to pick up on these micro expressions. So um, they put a whole series of faces in, in front of them and they said, what are these people feeling right now? And it's 25th of a second, they have to show happiness, sadness, fear, anger, disgust, contempt. And those salespeople that were better at picking up these micro expressions had better results. Um, both in terms of quantity and the and the value on the on the negotiations, this is lost on on video, um, and so it's just worth it's it's you know if if you've got a deal that's really important um, and it can wait, I would I would recommend that you do. If if you can't and and let's talk let's bring it back to business rescue in in the business rescue situation, um, it's it's a little bit more tricky because things are. N number one, we're all working in, in uh, unprecedented times and slightly out of our comfort zone, you know, from home uh, through video conference. Number two, time frames don't allow us to, to wait. You need to negotiate with your suppliers, you need to talk to your, your teams and so forth. You don't have the luxury of, of, of necessarily fully understanding how it is that they feel, except that you know that it's highly emotive, both for you and, um, and, for, and for the recipient. Um, or for your, your counterparty or the supplier in this case. 
if we if we move to and sorry just to remind you if you wanted to have a little bit a better understanding about micro expressions an easy way to do it is just to watch that series lie to me um, the the Paul Ekman who Paul Ekman who conducted these studies is actually a, de a detection decep deception scientist on the show um, if we move into telephone uh, I, I put that image on the left, by the way, and I almost wrote old-fashioned technology, just, you know, using our mobile phones. I know we use it all the time. I don't even bother showing an landline here. Um, but you're probably wondering why I've got Zoom on the right as well. What we need to keep in mind on the telephone is that um, with Zoom, we, we don't always show us our, uh, the video. And therefore, Zoom has become a telephone medium, even though it is marketed and used widely as a, as a video conferencing tool. Um, so always keep, always keep your context um, in mind as well. So, you know, talking on the telephone, I've lost all visual cues. So I'm going to be listening by the cues. I'm listening to tone of happiness or and I'm listening to voice inflections. Um, and, and sometimes you can't hear that, but there's, there's other flags. And I'll give you an example. This is a real example, um, although it happened outside of a business rescue, but I'll put it into a business rescue context just to bring the series together here. Um, I, we, I had a negotiation with somebody and we owed him, um, well, my client owed, uh, you know, let's just for the sake, say 100,000 Rand and couldn't pay it. And we needed the supplier to continue to supply and he refused to supply, it was critical, it was critical supply, he refused to do it until he was paid. Because the company had gone into business rescue, we, we weren't able to. Um, and so we got ourselves into a tricky situation. We'd, we'd, we'd made an offer of paying 30000 and he, and this was over the phone, um, and he was understandably you know, upset um, that you know, we owed 100 and got this 30000 offer with, with a proposal uh, you know, of how and where we can, we can do the rest. But, and he said, you know, can't, you, can't you bring it up to $78,000, uh, so Rand? And you know, they, they straight away I had this red flag because that was quite a specific amount. Had he said, you know, people would ordinarily say seventy or seventy-five or eighty, but but he said seventy-eight, which was quite specific. And it wasn't, you know, it it it, um, it wasn't that I was talking to a, a, one of the employees, and this would have been their after-tax number. And um, this was one of our suppliers. Over them a hundred on the nose, and this, the seventy-eight came up quite specifically. So so I put and asked, you know, why seventy-eight? And it turned out that he wanted to use, he needed the money, he needed the money for a bucky, for a pickup truck, a, a vehicle to deliver his goods, and, uh, and was relying on it, and, and also in order to continue to provide the services. We didn't have that money to give him, but our main inquiries were the, the business rescue practitioners, and they were separately, in a separate process, trying to sell some of the vehicles, including one of the security buckies or pickup trucks. And uh, we eventually made a deal that this, this gentleman could take this car, which was, I think, worth even a little bit less than 78, but it fulfilled his needs. And so there, simply by using whatever cues you have available or, or flags that are going off, we managed to create value despite not seeing the disappointment, although we could also hear it, um, despite not seeing the disappointment on, on his face. Um, but you know, other ways of building rapport in a telephone is also to try and match. You know, is to try and match the voice, um, pitch, and speed. I I'm really passionate about negotiation, and so when I'm passionate about something, I you know I speed up and I speak quite quickly. So by the way, stop me, anybody, jump in, just slow me down if you have to. Uh, but you know, when I'm when I'm speaking to somebody who's who has got shorter time frames, I, you know, I want to get things done. I'm energetic, and I just want things to happen. I have to adjust, and so I find I mirror their tone because number one is building rapport. Number two, um, you know, person with the, the faster time frames needs to need to pull back a little bit and allow somebody that you're speaking to just to understand the process and work with you. Um, and so, so you know, just just looking at um, um, or considering the telephone versus Zoom, I just want to give you an example here. If, you know, earlier on Maurice introduced me and that photograph of me, that is my profile picture on Zoom, was up in front of you and it said, I'd like to introduce my speaker on the topic of digital negotiation. Um, and that photograph is, is probably fine for this, for this context. Now, imagine that same picture 
and I'm having this conversation with you, I'm talking to a supplier and I'm saying, I'm truly sorry that we won't be able to pay you the outstanding 5 million rand for another couple of months, but I have a proposal that might interest you. So you're hearing one thing and you're seeing that face, which is suddenly not appropriate because I'm smiling at you. I had a look, by the way, at everybody, all the other panelists' picture, pictures that were up on the screen. And, you know, most people were smiling nicely into the camera and it's a perfect profile picture. But is it, we need to think about, is it, is it right? Because Zoom has now become a telephone. We've lost visual cues. This is the only visual cue. And suddenly that smile could maybe look like a smirk. Um, and, you know, I might then consider if I'm going into a negotiation to take that photograph off, just have the standard um, Zoom description of my name and that's it. Look at the sentence again. I'm truly sorry that we won't be able to pay you the outstanding 5 million rand for another couple of months, but I have a proposal that might interest you. Suddenly you'll find that somebody might be more receptive. So my point is, is that regardless of the medium, it's always very important to think about the context and how things look um, and how things might be perceived because we all know that perception is reality. So somebody might be, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's an emotive, business rescue is an emotive topic. You're telling somebody you can't necessarily pay them now or, or at all or, or you know, a small amount and have these emotive for both parties. But it might not come across if you've got that smiling, happy photo as opposed to maybe taking it off to be a little bit more sensitive to the conversation that you're about to have. If I look at, at email negotiations, if we move into the email space, you might be wondering, what on earth does a, a, a man having road rage and shoppers with masks on have to do with, with email negotiation? Um, I don't know about you, but that gentleman in the car on the left, if you had bumped into him in a shopping mall, not in your cars, just in the shopping mall on your bumped shoulders, you could have turned around, faced each other, smiled, said sorry, and came out there. It's put him in a, or, or any one of us probably, in a, in a, a steel container, coon, in our cars, and make a small little mistake. Every one of us had made a mistake driving. Make a mistake, and suddenly he gets, he's, he's got this road rage, because why? Because he's sitting behind this protective cocoon, and it might not even be his nature, but in the, on the road, he'll, he shouts to you and go, what have you done? You just cut me off, or you jumped a light, or it was my turn, or whatever the case is. In real life, it, he wouldn't have reacted like that. And I don't know if you've noticed recently, when you go, um, during these times where we might have to wear masks, before, without our masks, we were friendlier to people, of course, because you could just, just simply smile at somebody, um, and the tellers and so forth. Now, people are, are less friendly, and I've, even a couple of times, had my, my trolley pushed physically out the way. You know, I might have left it in an in, inconvenient place, sure, but having done it before, somebody might say to me, you're looking at each other without these masks, and you might say, um, Sorry, could you could you, could you move your trolley, please? I need to get the butter, whatever the case is. Whereas now we've got these masks, and people suddenly feel that they can behave in a different way. Um, now that I've pointed it out, you might notice it more. But if you think back to how we how we communicate an email, this is what we do. We 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 often use email as a as a um, we often feel quite protected by by the email and the fact that they're not seeing us face to face or hearing bring us on the phone and sometimes you can write in a, a you know we can be much more harsh in email than we might have been face to face on video and on on the telephone and you know lack of so, lack of social cues makes it difficult for somebody on the other side to read your tone sometimes you can see it because somebody might have said i am really angry now i've typed the words i am really angry that you've gone back on what we we, we agreed to 50 and the contract is 52 it might have been a genuine typing error, but when you've received it, you don't have the visual cues, and you might think that the person's just trying to quickly slip it through. 365-page contract, you might have thought that they were you know, acting um, you know, unethically. And so with email, we always need, to, email is the one I caution the most. We, we've got to be very, very careful, and I think we've all had a lot of, probably 20 something years, I think I first used email 20 years ago, we had a lot of experience with it, so we know um, where the pitfalls are. But um, we, given, given we sitting at home, a lot of us, we, we were relying on email um, more maybe than we would have before. Um, in fact, if we look at, if we, you know, that, that whole expression, a picture's worth a thousand words, 90% of our information comes from visual. 
So when using emails, I think it's got its place. Um, and in a negotiation, um, it's, always had a, it's always had a good place, I think. But we need to, we need to use it with caution. And remember, some, remember some, some other things. So negotiating on email, telephone, video conference is a longer process. I know this. Recently, I was in negotiations with two large corporates in South Africa, and the process had been, I came in after two years of attempted negotiations, and for six weeks, the, it was still going on through email and phone, and I kept saying, let's just get in a room, let's get in a room, let's all get together and spend a full day and just hash it out. It's a big topic, of, you know, there's seven or eight contracts being discussed here, but let's, if, if we can get together, we can, we can make significant progress. So, um, and we did, although that's, you know, a story I'll talk about in a minute. But the point is, is that with, with um, digital co uh, negotiation, things take longer. So try and make it better and easier and quicker. Put in the extra time. So for example, instead of the, if you're gonna send a 365 page contract, um, I don't want to, <laughs> I'd hate to be the recipient of them. But it, it would mean a lot to me if the person has said, I've made changes on the following 10 places, and they put a graph in to say, you know, the, or whilst we've adjusted the pricing in this manner, we've also adjusted the payment terms and, you know, hope that that, hope that, that works for you. And if you've got a little graph and you've got some, you know, indicators of where to go, a good lawyer will still check every word, sure, and there's probably software that can do that on the 365-page document. But in terms of the negotiation, it, will, it, will, it, it sits very well with the recipients and it speaks things up. They know where to look. You're not going to wait necessarily weeks on end while they go through every detail trying to find what you change. Because you, yes, you may have put track changes on, but you've also in the body been more clear about, um, about how you, you know, about what it is that you, you want to seekly negotiate through this email. Um, some, some tips, for example, on, on clear writing and email is, um, using numbers. One thing that drives me crazy, maybe because I'm a numbers person, is you know inconsistency. So, for example, if you're going to display numbers, some people might say 132,000, some people oh, 132 million, and show all the zeros without the commas. And it's quite hard. I'm sitting there counting, double checking that everything is correct. So, you know, to use the the commas is is um, for the for the thousands would make it a bit easier. Every single communication that that um, that I have with the accounts party, I think about what is going to make this clearer, what's going to make this simpler, what's going to make this easier. You know, simply just right aligning all the numbers and making sure that the decimal points are the same. As simple as that, it makes it makes it quicker to to digest and can speed up the process somewhat. Um, another example is this this picture here. When you want to show that you know a, 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 so how something might have been stable or not stable throughout the years. They're saying the same thing. The left and right graph is showing you the same data, but it's not useful than that, the, the graph on the left. So think about when you're presenting a, um, or replying on an email or presenting a topic, even on video, how can I make this clearer and therefore also speed things up a bit? Simply by adjusting the x-axis um, on, on the left, you can, you can show a better, you know, a better view of what happened between 1990 and 2005 in this example. Um, and then, of course, with email, you've got you've got words. Every word counts. Every everything that you write, you know, is important. Um, maintain professionalism, and build rapport. Start the email by saying, "Hi, you know, hi Robert, how are you doing? How was your your um, weekend? And you know, how are you coping through these? I hope you hope you're staying safe through these you know these difficult times. Um, or you know." Um, if you've got some information about the country specific, say, you know, you're so lucky in the UK that you can exercise at any time of day. <laughs> we, we restrict it to exercising before nine o'clock, which is making it a bit tricky. Um, but you don't have to delve into a lot of personal detail, one or two lines and, and then get straight into it. But use, you know, build rapport. But again, be careful of wording because what you lose with email is tone. Consider this sentence. I never said she stole my money. Do you know that there are seven ways that this can be read? There's seven words. There's only seven words. Seven small, easy words in the sentence. Um, so so um, listen to me carefully when I say the next one. I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole my money. 
I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole my money. And lastly, I never said she stole my money. Can you hear that the, the, the tone and infliction is, is different in every single word? So, so you know, a lot of, um, a lot of times when I've seen a negotiation that's been stuck um, at, or at an impasse, I've, you know, you, you've realized that a lot of it has happened through, through email, through telephone. There hasn't been that much engagement. And often when you get into that spiraling situation where you start, you know, arguing backwards and forwards across, across email or across um, other mediums, even telephone, when you're shouting down the phone because you're protected by that shield, somebody can't necessarily see you. Um, often it's, it's simply because a lot of it has been lost. Um, so, so we need to take care. There's, there, there was a study done on, on words. In fact, they used this exact sentence um, on words. And, uh, uh, sorry, this, this exact sentence was, was part of the study. But what they did was, the study, what they did was they, used, they, they put together a, a whole bunch of words. And they said some people had, had looked at it in a, in a face-to-face negotiation and some people had used those words just on email. And the people on email firmly believe that they understood the crux of the matter and the context and almost every single one of them had got it wrong. So we've got to be very careful about, about tone and every word. And maybe, you know, it, is, it might also be good sense to follow up emails with a call um, or a video call so that they can see who you are and see your gestures and see the smiles and see the intent, the good intents, you know, behind a, a, a topic or whatever it is that you, you're discussing. Um, it wasn't, so it, it's, it's probably worth, also mentioning SMS, WhatsApp, and team chats, because it's also words, it's also writing, and you know, you also, you know, it's, it's also binding. <laughs> um, but one thing that, one big caution that I want to, that I want to get across here is with SMS, WhatsApp, and team chats, it has, it has its place, and I'll tell you in a moment where, but the big caution is that it often disarms you because using WhatsApp, team chats, or SMS, instant, instant chatting to talk to a counterparty can often put you on the back foot. Um, the first thing I'll tell anybody about a negotiation is to prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, so, you know, we, we, you know I've, I've spent six weeks preparing for just one day's negotiation, and we've got an excellent outcome from that. Um, but in that time, had, you know, of course, there's engagement between the counterparty, and there have been calls where they phone and say, Angela, how have you got a minute? And I'll say, yes, hi. And I'll say, listen, we're just thinking about this. We want to run this proposal by you. I don't want to engage because I'm not prepared. I'm not necessarily ready. And there's no harm in saying, actually, I can't chat now. I might use the opportunity to understand what it is. I might say, just can you give me the bottom line? And they might, they might give it to you. But I would never engage in a negotiation on the phone or on WhatsApp or in team chats without having put in the proper prep. So, so the problem with this is that, it, it, as I say, it disarms you. Somebody could send you a quick WhatsApp and before you know it, it started at seven o'clock and you're sitting at 11 o'clock, four hours later, and you're chatting backwards and forwards between your supplier and you're making progress in terms of relationship, but you might also be giving things away and you might not be sticking to your strategy. So you might have formulated a strategy with your team. You might have had a view on what it is you want, what is the outcome that you want to achieve. And before you know it, you've thrown it away simply because you enjoyed the, the rapport and the relationship building side of it. And that's necessary. Um, but you, you, you haven't you know, kept your mind on the end game. You haven't remembered that it's, it's, it, you can't negotiate you, or you shouldn't at least negotiate unprepared. And often SMS, WhatsApp and team chats can draw you in. It can suck you in so quickly. Um, so you've got to exercise a lot of discipline when using... Um, feature is a quick quick um apps like sms and whatsapp and so forth another thing i spoke briefly about photographs and context and so forth i want to show you an example on a whatsapp imagine i've got a small supplier messaging me on whatsapp and they do by the way if somebody gets your mobile number people will message because it's uh, and i said earlier it's got this it's, it's got its place it can help move things through quicker and they might say look please pay us now we're a small, you know, we're a small family business. 
my children have never even been to the beach. And then can you imagine if my reply, and this is my real WhatsApp picture, is yes, I completely understand. And here I am on the beach, the yacht in the background. This photo could have been taken 20 years ago, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's not leaving a good, a good feeling for the person. So always be really careful about engagements that are unplanned, number one, and also that are um, quick and start spiraling you into giving away information that you might not necessarily have been ready to, to share. Um, is, does anybody have any questions before I carry on? I, I know that I'm going at quite a pace. There, there, are some, there are some questions that um, have, have come up, Angela. Let me just ask you, Angela, I, I would like the show to continue past 11. Do you, are, you, are you available? Because there are some questions, and I've also got some, uh, so, some additional points or some questions to ask, ask you myself. This is absolutely yes. brilliant. Yes. I'm, I, yes. I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm saying to myself, I'm going to certainly make sure that every single individual at Schindler's watches this webinar. This is absolutely fantastic. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I am available past 11. I'm just wondering about my children, if they can stay quiet for, for that long. So forgive me if, um, if they don't. Yeah, no, no, no problem. So we've, we've, got, we've got questions from Michael and we've got a question um, from Sarah. But if I could just jump in, because philosophically, the, 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 there's something I'd like to ask. There, there are two books. The one is Tipping Point. By mm -hmm. Malcolm Gradwell, and then his second book, uh, what was it called? Um, I've just read it, um, uh, Talking to Strangers. Mm -hmm. And in Tipping Point, uh, he makes the point that you've got to rely on your gut, okay? And he, he says that your subconscious, you cannot ignore because your subconscious picks up signals such as body language, so you shouldn't ignore your gut. So the question I have now is if one follows Malcolm Gradwell's logic, does one now ignore one's gut because our, our gut's going to get it wrong, okay? And then a second, a, a, a second aspect of uh, flowing from Glad, Gladwell's uh, second book, which kind of, in, in a sense, contradicted his first book, he, he, he quotes, I'm, I'm going to read to you a quote. In 1938, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain flew to Germany to meet Adolf Hitler, who was threatening war in Europe. Chamberlain's aim was to, to exact from Hitler a promise of peace, uh, of our time. Later, Chamberlain wrote to his sister, I got the impression that here was a man who could be relied upon when uh, uh, he had given his word. In Gladwell's thesis, meeting Hitler's face-to-face -face was Cha Chamberlain's mistake. Okay? The people were, who were right about Hitler were those who knew the least about him personally. Uh, in 1939, the Second World War began. So all very interesting. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask, ask you to answer those questions now. They're just thought-provoking. People may want to ask questions in relation to that, but I make those points. But let's jump into Michael's question. What is the best way to communicate with a Zoom audience who switched their video um, on and off? Now, again, then, uh, another interesting nuance that I'm just going to mention is that surely if you want to be deceptive, if decept deception is your intention, then you would uh, turn your video off. But let, let's throw Michael's question to you. Uh, Angela, what do you, what do you say? So, so, so how do we deal with it when they're switching it on and off? So number one, uh, that's distracting. It was going on and then off and then on and then off again. Um, because in the back of your mind, as yours have just gone off, um, in, in the back of your mind, you are wondering, are they distracted by something? And that's, again, disconcerting and disarming because, and frustrating because you, you, you want to make progress and go forward and you're not sure if they're distracted. Um, or if they are switching it off because maybe it is easier to lie to somebody if you're not face to face or they don't want you to see their face when you put an offer forward. So the, the answer is, and it's not a great answer, but it's, it depends. It depends on the context. It depends on where you're at. So personally, I've, I've, I'm looking at some of my children's Zoom, um, Zoom um, schooling. And I prefer when they're all off because everybody's fidgeting at the age of three and five. You can imagine everybody's fidgeting and, and so forth. And it's extremely distracting. Um, and we can't focus on what the teacher is saying at all. So, so there's pros and cons to both. Um, having it off is, is you know, if you, if you do want to, by the way, this is another, you know, webinar on its own and a whole other conversation about, you know, your moral compass or ethics or lying or bluffing or whatever you want to call it in a negotiation. And, you know, it, it is difficult to, to lie to somebody's face, especially somebody that you have a really good relationship with. And let's, and let's use the word bluff. It sounds softer. Um, 
So, you know, you may then choose to have a call as opposed to a video conference if you want to mask that. Um, and if somebody that has, has been negotiating with me face to face from day one or through video conference from day one suddenly switches off the camera or suddenly makes, you know, there's, again, as you, you spoke about gut feel, I always, uh, as I've got older, in fact, I'm, I'm not going to say always, I never used to, but as, as I've got older, I've learned to trust my gut because your gut feel is, is you, you're getting better and better as you get older about picking up on your non-verbal cues. So, um, so even if I can't see his face, but he's acting out of character, I might wonder, I don't even ask, I'm, you know, I'm straightforward. I might actually say, suddenly your camera's off, why is it off? Um, is it broken? Should we, should we chat again later? Or, um, so again, the answer, the answer is it, it's very contextual and it depends. And there's a place for it. There certainly is a time that cameras need to be off. For example, now it would be quite you know, distressing for me to have all of you up on the screen while I'm speaking to you. Equally, though, it feels quite unnatural, uh, and I hope it hasn't come across, but it feels very unnatural for me just to be talking to this empty room about a topic that's usually very, very engaging. Uh, interestingly, now, just going to Malcolm Gradwell mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the comment that he makes around Hitler, mm -hmm. um, I, I think what the, the point that's being made there is Chamberlain got conned by Hitler. So in other words, Hitler had a really, really good poker face because we know that uh, we, we do have these micro expressions and that they exist. Um, and now, in essence, everybody's wearing a mask like poker players do. Um, you know, so I, I think that too, are, are there two aspects to it? Sometimes uh, you've got to actually, it's perilous to look at somebody's face because they can manipulate their facial yes. expressions to actually con you. And, and, and people do, and excellent negotiators are able to manipulate, are able to put forward. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example where we, we I, I, was, I was leading a, a big negotiation recently and we did really well in the negotiation. And um, whilst we had the, uh, you know, the, some of the terms of the agreement, Fine lines, contracts weren't weren't put together, um, and still had to be drafted. And of course, devils in the detail, and you know, a lot can unravel during that time. But we had to call, uh, you know, the board to advise about the outcome. And we, whilst we'd left the building, we were standing in the it was late night, we were standing in the parking lot, and and uh, I got really nervous because up until that point, every one of us had put on a really good, I think, a really good poker face and a really good game face. Um, in order to get to that position, but in the parking lot, and I said, you know, don't, don't look happy, don't high five, <laughs> don't, you know, don't smile ear to ear because we still have all these contracts we need to write up, and and you know, it's, and and the, the deal's not done until it's signed, um, and got on the call, and everybody got so excited suddenly speaking to the, I, had, I actually said, sorry guys, let's just can we please just cut this, can we please just cut this call. I will phone you back later because this is, you know, if anybody happens to peek out the window and see our, you know, elation, it's going to throw everything. Nothing, nothing it wasn't signed. We just agreed in principle. So, um, so yes, there definitely is a mask. And some people are much better at it. And I would imagine that Hitler's superb. But one thing about micro-expressions is that, is that apparently is that you can't help it. So um, I was mediating once and um, not apparently, you can't help it. Even, even, um, even this, this tribe sitting in Papua New Guinea or, you know, the top negotiators and so forth, this micro-expression flickers across. It's, it's one twenty-fifth of a second. It's quick. You have to know what to look for and you need to, uh, you need to be looking. So if you're putting an offer forward and you're presenting it to four different people, I can't be looking at four people's faces to see what it is. If it's a financial number, I might be looking at the CFO or the person who I know is going to make that decision. Um, and so I might miss it. And, they might, and people generally, the, the good negotiators, have got poker faces. And so there you, you, you miss it. Um, and I think on video you do. I don't think any transmission can transmit quick enough to capture that um, that expression. Let me ask you the question then, flowing from that. How then, if somebody's wearing a mask, does one? How would you detect deception? What does one look out for? There's, there, so, so for me, if I, you know, if, if I'm if I'm in this mask and I'm sorry, if I'm behind the mask or doing it on video or telephone, whatever else, there's other cues that I look for. So, um, so if if Number one, people can't always remember a lie. So if, if they've got a whole story behind why an offer is what it is, I might a few days later so ask a specific question. And if they've lied about it, it takes a long time for them to quickly remember it or the sequence of it or what have you. And so you can just pick up that there was a, a longer pause than usual or if, you know, if, that's on, if that's on the phone, for example. And on the email, it's, it's, it's really hard to pick up deception, I must admit. 
Um, and and as I say, I've, I've, you know, I've emailed, I always use with caution, and I like to leave it just for the end where you finalizing um, you know, the, the contracts and so forth. But, but on the phone, as I say, as you, you said, actually, you brought it up, and it's a, it's a perfect point, is that you start to learn over the years to go with your gut feel. I never trusted it when I was younger. And every single time I went against my gut feel, I've, I've made a mistake. As I've got older, I've learned to trust it. And sometimes I don't know why. So somebody's called me and, you know, their tone might have been more flat than usual or more happy or, um, or in worse is, you know, you're having this conversation and the technology keeps cutting up and you can't actually hear what they're saying. And so you've, you, you've got the gist of it. The gist is that they've made an offer and the offer is X, but you didn't hear anything else because there was so much noise um, around us, so whether it's noise from the, the technology failing, I don't know if that makes sense, or actual noise, street noise, because they're called from a coffee shop or something. And um, it makes it quite tricky, which is why I often will say, sorry, could we, could we, could we chat again later when, or I'll, I'll fly down and come and see you, this is not a possibility right now. So then I might say, could we chat again later when I can be more focused and I can listen properly for cues that might come up. It's not a perfect science. Um, and, you know, it's not to say we, we get it right. We, we, we don't, we don't, we can't possibly get it right all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember in the, in the beginning, my husband hated that I've been trained in micro expressions because even a little white line, you know, <laughs> you know the usual, do I look fat in these jeans? <laughs> you know, it's, it's difficult to hide if, you, if you're looking, if you're looking specifically for, um, for cues around what the, what the real answer is. Oh, thanks, Angela. There's a, there's a question which you'll get to by Sarah, but I just want to mention to the audience that there's in fact a disorder known uh, called social emotional agnosia um, and it's the inability to perceive a facial expression body language and uh, uh, voice intonation and it says a person with this disorder is unable to non-verbally perceive others emotions and social situations but in essence this discussion really emerges from a forced social emotional agnosia of sorts because we're wearing masks mm -hmm. um, so Let's just move over to Sarah. Hi, Angela. So uh, businesses are really needing to have some very difficult conversations with their staff. Any tips, e.g. body language, etc., on a video call to create an environment of care. Video may be the best avenue at the moment. I feel people are genuine but may not realize things that they, that they do over the call, which may cause barriers, e.g. the profile picture that you've given. So just to, to, to jump in, firstly, before Angela answer, answers the question, I do want to mention that COBRA, uh, we have trained and qualified mediators. And what we have been doing is we have been meeting with the staff. And it's been important uh, because of the issue that you, you, you raised. There's, there's an automatic distrust with an employer, uh, between the employer and the employee. And that's, that's generally uh, how one kicks off. The moment you introduce a COBRA mediator, um, you, you, the, the employees, are far more trustworthy. So bear that in mind. But over to you, Angela. What's so, your answer to the question? You answered part two of my question. But so, so it's an excellent question, by the way. Uh, I think it was Sarah that, uh, that put it forward. Um, just last night, I was talking to a company who is in a big company who's in business rescue, and they have, um, they have to uh, make various announcements to tens of thousands of people. And the announcement yesterday didn't go very well because they were. Um, First of all, they were making it, and they discovered during the call that a number of people, through because of firewalls and so forth, couldn't access it. Which can you imagine the frustration? This is this is an announcement that impacts directly impacts their livelihood and directly impacts the ability of people to put food on the table, and they aren't able to join this call. So that started. It didn't start very well. Secondly, um, during the transmission, they they had somebody running in saying that there was a problem. And um, it, it broke the flow, it broke the, uh, the rapport that they were trying to create. And it also, it, it also you know, made everybody who's already feeling unsettled and uncertain, it, made, it, it knocked everybody off their game. And, and you know, so, so it didn't go very well, let's put it that way. And, and uh, I chatted last night with, with, um, with the CFO and we were, we were saying that you know, the, um, what they're going to do now is they're going to pre-record these videos. A video is the better way to do it. In this instance, there's no, they're, they're, you know, we, we, we can't get everybody together in a big hall and have these conversations. Even, and, and in fact, a company of the size, you couldn't do it anyway, or easily do it anyway. So what they're going to do is they're now going to pre-record these videos, check it, have a look at it, and then send it off. So people can also look at it in their own time. 
because don't forget people at home they've got children they've got other responsibilities they've got noise they've got all sorts this is this is important information so to pre-record this and send it off it, it makes questions a little tricky so you could you know give the title and the and the content you know in advance and ask for questions and address them in the video and um, the second the second part is just uh, i've just got a little bit off track what did you um Maurice, what were you saying about the second part that I said you'd already answered? Because I had something I wanted to add. No, yeah. so, so um, let me just read the, the question again. Maybe it'll refresh your memory. Some businesses are really needing to have some very difficult conversations with their staff, right. any clips, body language, etc. And what I mentioned is that we have at Cobra, yes. at mediators like yourself, you are a mediator. And that's the beauty of Cobra is we've all come together as mediators. I'm also a mediator, incidentally. Um, and we're there to assist. Um, and, and that's the point I was making in relation to the question that we can in fact do it and you don't need to have the anxiety in relation to trust because we're there for you. Um, yeah, so, sorry, so, so, and that, so that was my point, is to use experts. So whether it's a mediator, whether it's, it's uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the CEO of the company that puts that video together. Um, it should be somebody that's trust, that, that at least comes across, you know, trustworthy and so forth. Somebody that you know that the, you're talking to tens of thousands of people sometimes that they can relate to. Um, and, you know, having a, <laughs> no offense to our lawyers on here, but, you know, having a, a lawyer with, you know, clever language and so forth might also not be the right way to do it. You know, you've got great things that, you know, maybe and this is not this is not dumbing down any content, but you you're talking to a wide audience and therefore you need to make concepts clear and and um, and short and simple. Um, but using experts is is, uh, is is twofold. That's the one we've spoken about. The second is because they are expert in this in, in these situations. So you know a business process um, practitioner is is more trusted because in, in some ways, because they are acting in the best interest of the company, not necessarily themselves. Um, uh, sorry, the, as, as opposed to the company talking to suppliers, this isn't a supplier conversation. For them to send a video or to have these, these uh, conversations, it takes out the emotion, makes it less emotive. Um, because also don't forget that one of the things that can easily, um, you know, take away from a negotiation is ego. <laughs> Another topic I can talk about for hours on end, um, and you know, if you, you on, on both sides, and especially when there's emotion and livelihood and all sorts involved. So to use experts who are impartial helps you know, portray a message and an, uh, an emotional message. They can still show emotion. They can still show empathy because they feel it. We all, you know, we're all feeling it right now. Um, but they, you know, they they don't have a whole lot of hatred. <laughs> Some people don't understand, you know, why a company might have gone into business rescue. And, that, and you know, this one company in particular I'm talking to, I know that there's been a lot of um, you know, hatred even, it's used such a strong word, but towards the CEO when, you know, he's, he's done everything right and, this, you know, COVID is out of his control. It's a, it's a global issue. Um, so, yeah, that was an excellent question, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, I think I must make the point there that um, when it comes to, you made a very, very valid point that, uh, attorneys don't necessarily are not necessarily good and they're not necessarily uh, uh, qualified and I totally agree with that and when you do a mediation course as an attorney the first thing they try and do is to take uh, the the attorney hat off and they they move towards a facilitative mediation where you just you look at needs interests and concerns of the parties and you try and marry those up um, and and that is that is why I think the very first thing they do is say don't be a lawyer because the last thing you want is for a lawyer to be present as you say with the fancy lingo and uh, that immediately dissipates the trust because why is a the lawyer there? The lawyer is there to protect uh, the company's rights to the detriment of the employees. That's the, the automatic inference. But the perception and as, as yeah. I said, perception is reality. And lawyers are also intimidating for a lot of people. Um, so again, you know, when, when you're thinking about a communication, any communication in any negotiation, particularly in the business rescue, we need to think about how this, how this is, you know, how it is perceived. What is the right way to do this? Accept, in fact, I've got a little summary slide. Let me just pull it up here. Um, you know, to summarize, I suppose, this, the, the, the whole presentation is what, I'm not saying we need to end it, but to summarize what I've said is number one is be prepared. So if you're receiving WhatsApps and so forth, you might not necessarily be prepared to answer it. You don't have to. You, could, you, you don't have to be impolite. You can say, uh, you know, I can't chat about this right now. I'll get back to you in, in the next day or two. Um, but don't, don't get sucked up and fall into it. Um, 
but in, in you know, um, maintaining respect and professionalism. So I find, I find this a lot in my career that um, as you move away from, as, as you, as you um, and this is, this is you know, good in a way as well, but as you build relationships with people, so you know, you're not going to necessarily maintain that, all, that, that high level of professionalism, you can start chatting a bit about mountain biking or whatever it is, but I, but I worry about applications like WhatsApp and so forth because then it just really drops. You start using emojis, which, by the way, I'm not completely against. I don't think they're very professional. I wouldn't even put it in an email. But it's quite nice to, to convey tone. But I don't like to do it in a, in a business context. Um, the, next, the next point is, is an important point for digital negotiation. I don't know if I've stressed it enough. But we need to anticipate and mitigate longer time frames. It is going to take longer. Uh, backwards and forwards in email, backwards and forwards in video conference and telephone. So when I say anticipate it, just know that it's going to take some time and, you know, and, and plan for that, number one. And unfortunately, sometimes you don't have the luxury of time, especially in business rescue, and, and then mitigate that. How do we mitigate that? So as I've said, in, you know, in replying to an email, think about making a, putting, adding a graph or a picture or whatever it is to help with an understanding. Or on a call, say, look, you know, so I've set it up for an hour, but we can go over if you need to, because it's, it's really important that we get to the crux of why we haven't, you know, made progress, you know, with our, our critical supplies that we need to keep this business going during business rescue, for example. Um, my next point here is to, is to communicate often and clearly. In South Africa, I don't know how many people have dialed in from overseas, but in South Africa, we, we had, you know, a, a, a three-week lag, I think, or almost three-week lag, between one address from our president and, and the next. So leading up to the first, you know, from the first address where he put us all into lockdown, everybody was praising and really happy and really pleased that we were taking such a good, strong step towards this country, you know, towards the spread of, of coronavirus. Um, the next address came in, um, you know, a few weeks later, but we knew when it was going to come because he told us we're locking down for three weeks and he extended it, you know, a couple of weeks. And so we were still happy. But after the last, um, the last extension, we never heard anything for a long time. And that's where it started fueling a lot of anger. And even from people who are reasonable and, and sensible and understand numbers and understand exponential you know, charts and so forth. So, so you know, on one hand, understand what's going on from a coronavirus perspective and then separately balancing it with the economy. I still, I still think that you know, they haven't done a good job to explain, um, to help us understand if you if you're communicating often and you also and clearly you know help us understand like what are the reasons behind some of these decisions it would take away a lot of the pain and a lot of the, the spiraling that's currently happening um and by the way i've just i've just broken one of my own rules which is you know try to keep politics and governments and your views and opinions and so forth out of negotiations because you don't know where people sit um but then and then lastly we've already discussed this you know to use experts as needed the whole time, though, it, we, we, when you're going through all of this, always stay focused on the end game. The end game is we want to um, get a good resolution here. We want to find a good way forward for our suppliers and for our staff and so forth. Um, or in you know, other, other negotiations, you want, to, you want to get a really good deal for our business at, at a good price and payment terms and so forth. So regardless of what the medium is, regardless of what's going on, constantly, constantly remind yourself, what is your strategy? Some tactics have now been you know, taken away from us because of this, um, I'll give you an example. When I talk about taking some tactics away, um, one of the, one tactic that I really enjoy using is, and it's really powerful is, is, um, is the power of silence in a negotiation. So putting an offer down and keeping completely, completely quiet um, after that. And you'll find that, or, or receiving an offer is actually even better. Somebody receives an offer and you can be completely quiet um, they, they will, you'll find that people squirm, they can sit for, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds, but they start squirming, they start getting uncomfortable, they look around, they see, they're looking at other people, either on, you know, in, in, in the meeting, they check their phone, and eventually, either they'll start giving more information, which is really useful, or they start negotiating against themselves, so they concede without even having, you know, heard what we think about this in, initial proposal. I think that that's taken away in um, in digital negotiation because and, and you know this is, you know I'm, I'm happy to have this conversation if anybody disagrees but if I if somebody puts an offer forward and I just go completely silent they can say hello are you there <laughs> and I can't say yes yes I'm here I'm just doing the power of silence you know you you have to so 
some of the tactics that you might use to get to the strategy and you're keeping this end game, you, you, you have to rethink how you do it. How do you get this information that you needed? Um, and it's not always easy and sometimes you have to do this on the fly and we're all learning as we're going along. Uh, but it was, one, it was just one point I'd like to, I wanted to just bring up. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to ask one final question before we conclude. Um, if there are any other questions, I ask that the audience please post them now. Um, the question I have for you is, you mentioned politics, that you avoid politics. Um, I, I guard against, I tell my staff to guard against um, wearing tyres as an example with a little club on it, you know, let's say Liverpool or Manchester, uh, for that very reason, because you don't know um, whether the recipient you know, hates Liverpool, or hates Manchester, and, and, and one can't um, really manage that. That that It is a form of communication, isn't it? What are your views on that? I agree wholeheartedly. So in the beginning, when you don't know anybody, uh, I've said, you know, build this rapport, find commonalities, look up, you know, um, what you may or may not have in common, understand where their, their, um, their trigger points are, it makes them angry. Some people might, just the very mention of the name Trump might make somebody extremely angry, somebody else might be completely, uh, you know, it, you, and also you'll be quite surprised at, at who supports and who doesn't support. He's, he's a great topic, by the way. Um, so, so I completely agree with you to not have insignia on your clothing because you don't, you don't want to add to it. You don't want to make things more difficult. But in, in, this is in the beginning. As you get to know your counterparties and um, well, so you can use that as a as a tool to help you. So, for example, I was helping a family once, a um, small family with a small business, and they were being bought out by a large mining company. And um, uh, this this negotiation in itself was quite tricky because I was having internal negotiations between the father and son. The son. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, had a fake MBA certificate up on his wall and had a very different view of himself as um, versus what other people thought. And so it was quite difficult to have him in these negotiations. And his father was just so, it, the product was one of his babies. And he's, you know, once it needed to sell, actually, let me rephrase, not wanted to, he needed to sell, but he was really battling to let go of this product. And he was up against this huge mining company who had a lot of money and power which, you know, which was immediately, and power is another topic we can talk about for hours, but um, it, it immediately um, um, disarmed him. I'm sorry, I've forgotten actually where I was going with this particular example, because so much, just thinking about that negotiation and so much um, uh, came out of it. Let me just try and think, uh, get back on track. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've completely forgot, I lost track of this, of this, of this thread. No, no, we were talking, yeah, no, 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 I mean, it, it, it's really in the context of, um, you know, just avoiding anything, well, I think what you're really saying is as mutual, oh, sorry, yeah. mutual as possible. Oh, you, you reminded me, so avoiding and sitting yeah. and so forth, sorry, there was, yeah. there was one, there was one trap from the, from the mining house, that we just couldn't break, we tried to build a pool, we couldn't understand, and he was, he was a big um, influencer in this decision, couldn't understand um, how he what he was thinking I couldn't really read him very well he didn't he didn't attend a lot of our meetings in person um, and it, you know we were using um, teleconference quite quite a lot it wasn't my, my um, preference but they were quite far away so and you know didn't engage much so when we had the opportunity to meet with him I needed to jump on that because I had to I needed to break down this barrier there was a massive barrier and I couldn't understand it because Four out of the five of them wanted to buy this company, but he, was, he wasn't. Was it a game face? Was he paying bad cop? I didn't know. What I did do is, is I love Google. I did a lot of searching, a lot of searching about this guy, and I discovered eventually that he likes fly fishing. I know nothing about fly fishing. Uh, I don't want to. Um, <laughs> I've got no interest. But, um, and I also could tell from other engagements that he really, really didn't like the sun in this, in this negotiation. Most people didn't, actually. And we were battling with him a lot. But what I said to the son is, go and find, do you know anything about fly fishing? No, I didn't. Go and find and read up on anything and everything there is to do about fly fishing. And then go do it. Don't just read about it and tell me that you know everything you need to know. Go do it. Go have a couple of weekends away. Go do some fly fishing, which he did. And I said, and then I need you to, to, to create a relationship with that guy. And it was quite risky using the sun as well, but we didn't really have much of an option because it seemed quite unlikely that I would suddenly have this interest in, in fly fishing. Anyway, uh, in our next meetup, I made sure we got there early and I said, find a way to make a beeline with a coffee or with a scone or whatever it is, find a way to make a beeline and just start talking to this guy and mention you've just come back from a fly fishing trip. 
And that one tiny little thing made all the difference for us because there was a, we found a commonality and we kind of, we, we broke it a little bit. He put his game face on, sure, back in the, in the meeting, but he, he definitely appeared much more engaging um, and, and more willing to proceed with this deal than he was, than he was before. And it was the smallest thing. Now, I mean, can you imagine if, if he was, if he was a, a hunter, for example, and, um, and we arrived there with anti-hunting insignia, well, not that we were, but in a professional setup. So when you talk about Liverpool and Manchester, you're absolutely right. I would never go in um, on assumptions of, of, you know, and you don't want to deceive. I, I know that that fly fishing was, it, it was, was a, a form of deception, by the way. Again, I talked the whole moral compass, ethics, lying, bluffing, and so forth. You don't want to deceive, but you do need to find a commonality um, so, so yes, I'm, I agree with you. Look, deceptions, deceptions, natural. You find it in the animal kingdom. You find it with uh, animals mimicking uh, poisonous mm -hmm. animals. So it, 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 it is natural, and one does find it. Um, yeah, the, best, the best example. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Maurice. The best example of deception in the animal kingdom is that Coco. Do you remember Coco the gorilla? She, I, think, I think she's died since, but yeah. um, she she fell in love with and was given this little kitten and she really was very close to him and what have you. At some point Coco had broken a basin, a giant basin, and when they somebody came up to the, the cage or wherever she was kept and said, What happened here? You know, how did this how did this this um this basin break? Um, um he pointed to she pointed to the kitten. <laughs> which is quite you know, which is quite fascinating that, you know, even in the animal world, they don't want to get into trouble. They can sense that that anger and fear. Certainly. Thanks so much. I mean, we, we've overshot our, our, our time by 20 minutes. Um, and I see no participants dropped off. So you've done very, very well. Thanks so much, uh, okay. Angela. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying it now. I'm going to get you back. Um, this is so interesting. And I've got a million questions that I uh, want you to answer. So thank you. And thank you to the panelists. And thank you to the audience. Um, this is Cobra. This is what Cobra is about. You know, I got a taste of uh, Angela as a mediator. Uh, she's highly, highly skilled, and this is uh, what we have available for businesses in distress in these trying times. So thanks, everybody. Um, we have more webinars. We have a webinar tomorrow, so hopefully we'll see you all then. Thanks, guys. Cheers.